Hey, good morning and welcome to St. Peter's by the Sea uh, on this fifth Sunday in Lent. We're glad to see each and every one of you, whether you're here in the sanctuary or at home uh, worship, worshiping with us online. My name is Lisa Farmer and I am the Mission Outreach Elder here at St. Peter's. As always, the upcoming events and announcements can be found in our Thursday email. Um, and you'll also find the Holy Week schedule in the Thursday email and in the bulletin. Please connect there to find ways to participate in our life together. And now, will you rise in body or spirit as we join in our responsive call to worship? Let us wait patiently for the Lord to help. The Lord will lift us out of the pit of despair. Out of the, mud and out of the, mud. the Lord will set our feet on solid ground. And our steps the, the Lord has given us a new song to sing. A hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what the Lord has done and be amazed. And so we trust in the Lord. Now let us sing. May be seated. God meets us where we are. We have only to respond. God's grace covers whatever shortcomings we have. Let's turn to God together to confess our sins, first together and then silently. Be gracious to us today, our Lord, for we are in need of your mercy. We are often quick to doubt and slow to pray. We are tempted to let go of faith when we need to hang on. We are discouraged by wrong when we need to be encouraged by your spirit. Oh God, you are thankful for the strength you give us to trust in you all the days of our lives. Amen. Let's take a moment for quiet reflection. Merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that they may be cleansed from all their sins 
and serve you with a quiet mind. Amen. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself, is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Friends, believe in the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. standing in the back I realized oh it's my part we have the opportunity to uh, bring before the Lord our tithes and offerings and so if you're joining us online there's a variety of ways to give we want to encourage your participation if you're here in the sanctuary uh, we'll pass plates but we also realize that's not the primary way a lot of people just give regularly online in order to support the mission here we believe that God gives us all that we need in order to do the mission that God calls us to. And so we're praying also for God to open up new creative avenues for ministry. We've seen it in a variety of ways in terms of our Kids Cove on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, homework help for students. Uh, we've got an English club going uh, once a month here on campus, just uh, interacting with those that are needing to strengthen their language skills. Uh, we've been able to uh, work with uh, amazing Ukrainians. Let's just say it that way, right? Uh, uh, Siri and Vitalina, we've got Kate and Alex here today. These are all just a part of what God is doing. And so being a part of it means just participating in it. And so we're so grateful for all who are uh, making St. Peter's a uh, place to belong. And so let's pray together as the ushers come forward to receive the offering. Lord God, thank you for all the goodness that surrounds us. Thank you for this time of year that we celebrate new life. But Lord, we know the ultimate life that's coming is the life that's found in Jesus Christ. So help us to live into that reality, to give ourselves to it, and send us out, Lord, that we might proclaim this good news to the world around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
in the coming months, uh, we've committed ourselves to a practice of uh, on the third Sunday of the month. This is third Sunday, isn't it? Um, we're going to do a ministry spotlight. So uh, once a month, just give you an idea of uh, some of the things that are happening uh, here at St. Peter's. Uh, it might be a, one of our teams or a committee. Uh, today, as you've noticed on the uh, patio as you've come in, uh, there are all kinds of signs up. And if you look around, uh, there's likely one with your name on it as well. Uh, today is Meet Your Deacon Sunday. Uh, and so this morning we thought it just makes sense to make the ministry spot like the deacons. And so Heidi Swidrak is the amazing moderator of the deacons, uh, kind of the head deacon. Uh, I don't know what, how we... You're the chief. So uh, uh, she's going to tell us a little bit more about what deacons do and then uh, make some introductions. And so come on up, Heidi. Yeah. We know public speaking is one of your favorite things, too. So uh, it's great to have you here. <laughs> uh. Okay. Good morning, my St. Peter's family. Today is Deacon Recognition Sunday and also Meet Your Deacon Sunday. The Book of Order states, the ministry of deacon as set forth in scripture is one of compassion, witness, and service, sharing in the redeeming love of Jesus Christ for poor, the hungry, the sick, the lost, the friendless, the oppressed, those burdened by unjust policies or structures, or anyone in distress. Persons of spiritual character, honest repute, exemplary lives, brotherly and sisterly love, sincere compassion, and sound judgment should be considered for this ministry. Deacons are charged with the care of the church members and friends of the church. We provide prayers, home communion, assistance with meals, rides to church, and doctor's appointments, which are just some of the examples of what we do. We meet the second Tuesday of the month, and St. Peter's congregation is divided up into 17 parishes, which are each led by a deacon. I'm going to introduce each deacon here today to come up to the front, and if you're in the choir, which we have a few, just please stand up and be recognized. We have Mary Berry, Marlene Reed, TJ England, Marilyn Davidson, Jocelyn Blasky, Donna Morong, Carmen Erber, Jean Mangoni, we just had knee surgery, so she'll, we're so happy she's here today. Lou Stewart. Joan Shira Lander. Susie Sampson. Barbara Napier. It's in nursery. She's in it, yeah. <laughs> Phyllis Smith. Sorry. Sandy Hale. Sorry. And Jean McPeters. We have two deacons not here today, Marlene Rudd and Helen Dawes. These wonderful women all said something when asked to serve. They all said yes. Please come out to the patio and meet, greet your deacon after the service. Stay there for a sec. Stay there for a sec. Don't leave yet. Wait, wait, wait. I always have to add on just a little bit. Do you notice they've got this button that says, I said yes. Um, they're ready to share that button and give it to someone else. Um, because there's a lot of things that get said, uh, that we can say yes to. So it's not just a matter of saying yes to deacons, but I think that our saying yes really makes a difference in a variety of ways. And we've seen people saying yes all over the place here. So you do need also sometimes to say no. 
and that's okay too, uh, if it's just not a season that you're ready for. Uh, but I think saying yes is one of the most beautiful words. And I'm so grateful for the deacons in our choir, for uh, uh, Barb Napier in our nursery today serving, and all these that are standing here, because uh, the ministry of the deacons here at St. Peter's by the Sea has always been strong, and it's one of the ways that we're really our strategy in terms of being a caring congregation. So let's give a big hand to all of these that are stepping forward. So great. Now you can go. <laughs> all right. Well, as we uh, come together in prayer, there's a couple things. One is uh, it's in your bulletin saying that the walking group is going to be uh, walking today. Uh, this Sunday, they're not going to be. And so if you're planning to uh, head over uh, to near the senior center, yeah, you can walk solo, but it's not going to be a group activity today. Um, also, yesterday, I just want to report, yesterday we had uh, the recital, the SMILE uh, students here. Uh, it was incredible it was such a wonderful uh afternoon of hearing uh students that just were uh incredible in terms of their musical skills here i'm so grateful to uh the assistance from uh zach and bob and others who stepped up to make sure that our facility was ready and prepared uh, so that it would be a, a gathering place uh it was really fun there were students from all over um uh, primarily from Huntington Beach High School, but it was just fun to see all the little pockets of conversation and activity. It was a fundraiser for uh, Irvine uh, Cancer Institute, and so uh, just a wonderful way that our facility was used. As we uh, got to hear last week, two uh, 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 people sing. Uh, that was just a small taste of all the beauty yesterday. I did talk with the uh, uh, woman who's putting it all together. She's a junior at Huntington Beach High School, Kate. Uh, and I said, okay, this could be an annual event if you wanted to, because we'd love to host something like that. I think that kind of uh, uh, things happening here on this ground is really what it means to be the church and to be a place where people can gather here uh, and experience grace. And so, yeah, it was really fun. So with that, we're going to give ourselves to a time of prayer. Uh, we'll conclude in the words of the Lord's Prayer. It'll be on the screen behind us. Uh, but let's just continue to seek the Lord. Almighty God, we thank you that you come to us uh, in the midst of right where we are. Sometimes we feel that, uh, that we just need to know that you come and that it's not about our effort, but it's about your love reaching out and meeting us right where we are. Thank you, Lord, for all the good things that surround us, for the beauty of these days, for the occasion of rain, the glorious sunrises and sunsets, the things that remind us of just the beauty of this world and the beauty of the life that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for our daily provision. Thank you for that we have food enough to eat and clean water to drink. Thank you, Lord, for the safety that we live in here in Huntington Beach. Thank you for public servants, police firefighters, all who serve in ways of making our community strong. We pray that you would continue to lead us in those systems, Lord, that make life possible. That it might not just be for our own welfare, but also for the welfare of all. So, Lord, lead us in that direction. So, too, we recognize that there's brokenness. Individual lives and people who are struggling today some who are battling health conditions that are so discouraging, we know that we need your spirit to come alongside them. And so we ask for your healing to happen in their lives. We pray too for the healing that can happen as we come beside and care and listen and love. Thank you, Lord, for the ministry of our deacons who reach out to all who are in need. Help us, Lord, to stand aside, alongside one another in the midst of challenging times so that we might remind ourselves and remind those that we serve that we're not alone, but that you're always watching over us. So too, Lord, we ask you to move in those places on this earth that are so devastated by violence and hatred, that peace and love would break forth. We pray in particular for this conflict happening in Israel and Gaza, one that just seems so intractable and with no solutions. 
We pray, Lord, that you might grant wisdom. We pray also, Lord, for Ukraine and Russia and the conflict there, the devastation of lives lost and the society trashed. And so, Lord, our hearts break. Thank you, Lord, that we could be a small part of the healing of this world. Thank you, Lord, for your grace that compels us not to stand by and watch, but to move forward and act and to do it always, Lord, through the compassion that you inspire. And so hear us, Lord, as we commit ourselves to following Jesus and to pray in the way that he taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We'd like to invite you to stand in body or in spirit to sing for everyone born. at the table, a voice to be heard, a part in the song, the hands of a child, in hands that are wrinkled, for young and for old, the right to be place at the table to live without fear and 
Amen. You may be seated. I love that hymn. just rearranging the table up here trying to get myself back in check that was really good words so I get to name things before they happen um, which is a really odd thing okay I, I have to give titles to sermons that aren't written so they're kind of like giving a name to something and going, well, I think that's what we'll call it. And it's really strange. Um, I have to do that because in order to be prepared for all the different things that happen on a Sunday morning, we need to plan in advance and the choir needs to kind of fit in with what I'm going to be talking about and where the scripture's heading. But I give them names and then sometimes I feel when we get to the time, I go, oh, if only I could rename it, I would. Uh, but I've got to go with the name that I started with. Uh, and so I started looking up uh, this week, wondering about how they name movies. Uh, and, you know, they name movies, and we all say, well, of course that's the name of the movie. But that's not always the name that ends up in the final draft. And there was a movie by the name of Rocky, we all know. The original title of the movie Rocky was The Contender. And they probably decided the Contender 1, the Contender 2, the Contender 3, the Contender 4 wouldn't work. And the Contender 5. Because remember how many Rockies there were? <laughs> it's a good thing they stuck with Rocky. That worked really well. Uh, Field of Dreams, the original title of the movie was Shoeless Joe. <laughs> which makes sense if you've seen the movie. But they didn't want it to be a movie that people thought, oh, this is a guy that's just down on his luck and he doesn't have shoes. Uh, Field of Dreams works much better. Library Revolution was the original title of The Breakfast Club. They improved it with The Breakfast Club. That was nice, a nice way. And this movie had um, a title that I think, where did that come from? Back to the Future. The original title was Spaceman from Pluto. <laughs> oh, that was terrible. They definitely improved it. This one uh, that we all know as Toy Story had multiple titles that they wrestled with. One was Made in Taiwan, <laughs> The Cowboy and the Spaceman, and if you remember the 80s, I think this one's pretty funny, uh, Toys in the Hood. <laughs> yeah, pretty close to Boys in the Hood, and so I think Toy Story was definitely much better. So I'm under no illusion that my job is to present a blockbuster every Sunday with a weekly title. That is not what I'm here for. But what I hope to do always is to unleash uh, the wisdom and the authority of God's word and not simply my own. And that's important. That's an important distinction. That it's not about what I can present and say. And that you'll walk away saying, oh, that was smart. But really, how do we tap into what it is that God is saying? And how do we hear the voice of the Spirit. And so if I'm faithful to that task, I can be uh, in line with what the Apostle Paul said to the church in Corinth. As he was uh, 
kind of addressing some of the challenges that they were facing, he said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He said, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so that's the point of what we gather around every Sunday. The life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. That the cross, as we gather, is central to who we are and central to our understanding of God. That the cross kind of defines for us and reveals to us how we come to know this God. That we come to know it in the life and then also giving ourselves over to death so that it might result in an abundance of life and fruit. See, death is not the end, but rather death is a means of transformation. And so we're going to hear that in the text today. As we turn our attention to John chapter 12, beginning at verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew, and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. Whoever loves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of the world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I believe that this is a powerful, life-changing passage, isn't it? It stands in contrast to our expectations that we can reach out and, and get a hold of our best life now. If you hear an echo in what I said last week, then you're listening carefully. Because last week, I talked about the tensions that we live in. And I talked about the tensions, how our best life now isn't necessarily the kind of life that we design for ourselves, but it's the kind of life that connects more deeply with the divine. And we live in the midst of tensions. And if you only listen to last week and don't pair it with this week, then you're going to have an incomplete message. I think that most things are held in tension. One thing can be true, and then there are also other things that are true that we have to wrestle with. And so as Christians, we have a kind of both and rather than an either or. We can't read the scripture in such a way that we underline our favorite passages and then cross out the ones we don't really like. And some of what we don't like is when we hear the language of the cross. When we hear the invitation of Jesus, when he says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And yet, apart from that, how do we make sense of what it means to be a follower of Jesus? If we don't give ourselves to the, to the whole of the story and see that this is all that God is doing, then the church can kind of diminish to becoming just a human improvement project where we all do the things that help us feel good about ourselves, but there's no divine connection. 
So when I talked about the tensions, I said there are tensions of this sense of, of comfort and there's also a disruption that we need in life, that we need quite often an experience of grace, but we also need a truth that will call us onto the carpet, that will challenge us in a way that isn't about our own agenda, but it's about wrestling with the truth. We have the human and we have the divine. How do we encounter the divine? It's not as if God is in my pocket and I can pull out, say, here, let me share some more divine with you. How do we encounter the divine? How do we encounter the God who is God? Not just an exalted idea that we have in our head, but rather the God who meets us, who reveals God's self to us. And we have a sense of, of awe and wonder, a kind of awe and wonder that even transcends the beauty and awe of a sunset to where we know, ah, oh, God is revealed. This love, this grace comes to meet us. I think that my job as I've been uh, wrestling through the years is something like a wilderness guide. I think of myself as a wilderness guide attending to the necessities of the human soul so that we can forge a path to a Christ-connected spirituality in the midst of the secular world that we live in. That it's that Christ-connected spirituality. It's a kind of spirituality that isn't just about our ability to, to make a beautiful life, but rather it's our ability to live into the following Jesus so that we discover what life is really all about. A life that's connected to the divine. And so this morning what I want to say in this second part of a two-part sermon series is you are amazing, people. You are amazing, you're beautiful, you're lovable, you're creative, and I want you to be unique, okay? This is clearly the result of your own effort and determination. Congratulations. <laughs> this is also... I want to point out, combined with the gift of the raw materials you've been given, including your DNA, your family of origin, your life experience, and your location in society. So you're all of those things, beautiful, unique, lovable, and also you're called to surrender it all to God. Not just little parts of it, but all of it. Surrender it all to God. That's what Jesus invites us to in Mark chapter 8. We read that text. And he, and he said, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. So if you want to live fully, then, then we've got to learn to die. If we want to hold on to what is most meaningful in life, then we need to learn to let go. And as we let go, we discover a life that is truly life. Jesus in John chapter 12 is already in Jerusalem. So in the passage that we're looking, next week we're going to read from Mark about the triumphal entry where Jesus comes humble on a donkey into Jerusalem to proclaim a, a new kingdom that is coming to be established on the, this earth. This kingdom is going to be in opposition to the empire of Rome and in fact opposition to all empires of this earth. So that the kingdom would transcend in this kind of life that Jesus invites us into. And so Jesus in John chapter 12 has already in Jerusalem. And when he's in Jerusalem, he's encountering people who are on the outside. These Greeks who are there. And they come and they say, hey, we want to see Jesus. And so they go to the one most likely to make that connection. That's Philip. And then Philip goes to Andrew and they go, go to Jesus. Hey, some, these people want to talk to you. And what does Jesus do? He says, the hour has come. All the way through the Gospel of John, Jesus says, my hour is not yet here. My hour is not yet here. And now, in chapter 12, Jesus says, my hour has come. And then he begins to describe the road that is ahead, and that is the road to the cross. And he says, the Son of Man will be glorified. And when we think glory, we typically don't think of the cross. We see that as a symbol of shame. 
We see that as a symbol of shame that, that seeks to destroy life, and yet Jesus sees it as the way that we access the presence of God. And so if you want to see Jesus, then you'll be amazed and astonished by what you see. And that's what Jesus is saying here. You're going to be amazed by something you see that is going to be absolutely surprising. And so what I'd like to do this morning is to layer on the message from last week and let you know the other part of what you need to hear and see in order to live fully into the life that God calls us to. Because last week we looked at John the Baptist and, and drew from the wisdom of chapter 3. This week I want us to hear clearly chapter 12 where Jesus is speaking about the cross. And so... Last week I said avoid the comparison trap, so this week I'm going to add to it. Avoid the comparison trap and let compassion guide your steps. See, it's not enough just to say, well, I'm going to stop comparing myself to other people. I think that we need to stop comparing ourselves to other people and realize that we're not in this race to be the best or better than others, but, but rather we're in the kind of life where compassion needs to guide our steps and that's true of the cross even when we look to the cross what we see is a cruel instrument of evil designed to dehumanize and destroy the intent was clear from rome and that was to make you afraid and jesus wasn't afraid in fact jesus moved with compassion toward the cross he knew that it was the destiny from his father. He knew that he had a mission to complete, and he didn't back away from it, but he moved boldly forward into it. And it was love that led Jesus to the cross. And so what I want to invite us into is to let the love of Jesus and our love for Jesus guide our steps, to guide our steps in all that we do and all the places that we go. In John chapter 15, Jesus has more to say about the motivation that he has to go to the cross. And he also turns that motivation out to his followers and says, this is how I want you to live. Recently, I've become aware of a new translation of the scriptures that is the First Nations version of the scriptures. Uh, well written. Uh, scholars that are indigenous to America have looked at the scriptures and read them in such a way to say, how does this message get told in a language that we're familiar with? And so let me read from their uh, rendering of John chapter 15. To walk the road with me, you must love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater way to show love to friends than to die in their place. You are my friends if you walk in my ways and do what I say. I no longer see you as my servants, but as friends. Masters do not share their hearts and plans with servants, but I have shown you everything I heard from my Father. You may think you chose me, but I am the one who chose you. You are my new garden, where I will grow a great harvest of my love, the fruit that remains. When you bear this fruit, you will represent who I am, my name, then the Father will give you whatever you ask. I am telling you this so that you will walk the road of love with each other. I like that translation. That you'll walk the road of love with each other. So avoid the comparison trap and let compassion be your, guide your steps. Second is this. Embrace your uniqueness and... Steer clear of self-centeredness. Again, some things I would change. Uh, one of the things I would change about sermon titles, I take the question mark off the end. <laughs> it's not a matter of like life, death, fruit. It's life, death, and fruit. In order to get to fruit, death is important. But Jesus says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains a single grain. But if it does that, much fruit's going to come. He's speaking of his own life, but he's also speaking of our lives. If we're not learning how to navigate and, and a willingness to, to sacrifice and let things go, then, then all we get is the fruit of our own labor rather than the wonder of what God can do through the power of the Spirit. And so embrace your uniqueness, and here's what I would change, but 
Steer clear of self-centeredness. You need a little far, firmer word there. Steer clear. It's hard to do both of those. Because what we do in our society right now, it's all about our uniqueness, about our self. This is the age of the self-exalted to the glorious throne of every individual. And that's simply the air that we breathe. That's the world we're living in today. Everything is about the self. We're self-made. We're self-seeking. We're self-aware. Now, again, we need to hold these in tension. I'm not saying that the self is wrong or evil or bad, but I'm just saying that the self needs to be held in the right perspective. Jesus presents a different pattern than the pattern of this world. And it is the pattern of death and resurrection. Jesus essentially says to those that are coming to say, we want to see Jesus. He says, you want to see me? Look to the cross. You want to see me? Look to the cross. As you look to the cross, you're going to see a bold statement of God's love for the world. That there's nothing that humanity can do in terms of driving God out. That God doesn't persist and say, I love you anyway. The beauty of the cross is the cross reminds us that salvation is for all. That Jesus came to give his life for the world. And we can live into this relationship of the human connected to the divine. Now, last year I walked the Camino de Santiago and just had a blast. You heard stories once I came back. And I walked this ancient pilgrimage because I really wanted to have this sense of how can I go and listen to whatever the Lord might want to say to me on this long walk. Um, it was a fabulous life experience and one that I'm not going to seek to replicate in the same way, but my intention in this year is to get back on the Camino and do a little bit more walking and talk to some more people. But one of the things that I encountered when I came home, this book was on my desk because I had pre-ordered it. Had no anticipation that it would show up uh, right uh, when I got back. And it is the number six book in a six-part series written by Andrew Root. I want you to know, this is thick stuff, okay? So I'm not going to tell you, like, go buy this book. I think that, and again, I'm not trying to brag here or anything, but Andrew Root's pretty thick reading. Um, and it is titled, The Church in an Age of Secular Mysticisms. And I was like, okay, I got to go number six. This book lit lights in my brain in ways that I hadn't conceived of or thought of before. And so what I want to do is just offer a little bit of those colors to you today to give you some sense. Because I can't. <laughs> I thought, this is crazy. And I, I want you to know, I've, I've been anxious all morning. I wake up early on Sundays to get ready. Um, and I was just like, I don't know. What am I doing? I'm trying to take book number six after all of this. And even that, in and of itself, it's really hard to like summarize. I'm not trying to summarize it at all. But I'm trying to give you a picture. What Angie has to say is that there are different ways that we have, I think the subtitle's important, why spiritualities without God fail to transform us. What he says that we've got in our secular age today, spiritualities that aren't necessarily connected to God, but are like these generalized spiritualities, where we feel good because we're doing something spiritual, and so we're getting in touch with what he often says is a deeper part of ourself. And so there are two spiritualities that don't lead to transformation, but make for a good story. And the two that he names, actually he names three in tension in this book. He says there's the, the heroic action. And heroic action, when we do heroic action, we feel this sense of a transformation, an individual uh, freedom that comes to us because we've given ourselves to something that is difficult and hard. In terms of heroic action, he says that there are a number of different ways that we enter into that in our culture today. It can be through the experience of nature. It can be overcoming a sickness. It can be through exercise. Or it can also be through going on a very long walk called the Camino de Santiago. And I met a lot of people that the walk was the, this walk is going to transform me. Well, does the walk transform you in relation to God? Is that part of the equation? Or do you not hold that tension? You see, if we don't hold that tension of human and divine, then we just say, I'm going to do this for me. I'm going to go on a long walk and hope I discover something. And you know what? People discover a lot of things. And that's good. 
But does that bring them into uh, an experience of God? Experience of God's grace? The second way that Andy describes uh, the kind of modern mysticisms is in terms of the inner genius. And let me read this uh, a little bit more. The self's magnificent is claimed or won not necessarily by heroic action, but by discovering the self's most true inner identity. The process becomes spiritual and transformational to the core, overcoming guilt and bringing healing as the unique inner self expresses and receives recognition for its genius. It becomes mystically genius to find and claim who you really are. We hear that a lot today. In fact, we not only hear that a lot out there, what Andy is saying, we hear that even in here. And that, that we sometimes get distracted from what the message is. We think it's about heroic action or we're discovering our inner genius. But what Andy holds up is the difference that he describes as the beyonder. That life isn't just about flourishing here, but it's about flourishing in a kingdom that transcends all of that. And he says that the path is confession and surrender. Confession and surrender. And that for me is what it is all about. That if we want to step into that human and divine relationship, then we need to learn to live lives of surrender. To allow ourselves to experience those losses and rather than trying to hold on to it all, to feel this sense of this is what God is doing and it's okay. God is still in charge. At the end of our Camino, we had a ritual that we did in terms of naming the towers that we've been building and then a willingness to let go of all of that to discover whatever it is that God might have for us. Often what people do in our world today is they build towers and then bigger towers and bigger towers and bigger towers and think that satisfaction is going to be found in bigger stuff. And the satisfaction isn't found in the goods. The satisfaction is found in the good. And that is the good of God. And so we've got to be willing to let go of the things even that we create. And to say, I'm just going to Plant these seeds and see what might grow. Years ago when our son was uh, young, I think I was serving here uh, as a youth worker, we went on a vacation down in San Diego. Before I share this, I need you to know there was a time, I know most of you are aware, that we took pictures using a camera with film inside. Right? And so when you took pictures of the camera and film inside, you were very careful about how many pictures you took. We had a code uh it was a canon sure shot and you'd take the picture and it would automatically advance the camera or the film in the camera and uh, we were on vacation in san diego matthew was very young and he was building sandcastles on the beach uh joy was there taking pictures and she was he was so proud of the sandcastle he built this is a picture of me holding the picture because i did not have a digital copy of it and so there he is he's just feeling great He's like, look at the sandcastle I've made. And that's quite often us in life. Look at the life I have made, my good self, all of these skills and abilities that I have. Soon after that, as in seconds, thanks to the sure shot camera that would advance the film just in time to take the next picture, this happened. <laughs> Tell me that's not the best sequence of pictures. Oh, what? I mean, all the work that he's done. And sometimes when we think about like letting things go, we have the same expression like, no. But if we see in it the invitation to not hold on, but to let go and to trust. Do you remember? I did this again. I'm like reliving my youth leader days. But remember when we used to do trust falls? Right? You would line the whole youth group up, and then you would have one student stand there and say, trust us, we're going to catch you. Uh, I want you to know, I was 100%. I caught everybody. We, always, we never let people go. But you had to like, sit there and just relax and then go all the way back. And your natural reaction is to not let that happen. It's something you've got to practice in order to live that kind of trust. And that's what Jesus is inviting us into to trust, 
to let go. Last week I said, find joy in Jesus. And I believe that we find joy in Jesus by discovering the glory of the cross. Find joy in Jesus by discovering the joy of the cross. Because what Jesus is saying here, he's saying that the Father looks and says, I've glorified your name. Jesus said, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. Something happened on the cross that broke the back of the evil in this world. The evil's being driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. That's the bold proclamation that Jesus, even on the cross, will be there as a reminder of what he's done and that the church doesn't shy away from the cross. The church doesn't kind of move to a human improvement project. But we continue to declare the fact that God meets us at the foot of the cross. And that the cross isn't the final word. But rather the cross is the sacrifice of Jesus. And then three days later, there's a resurrection to new life. And we're invited to let go. But we're invited to let go not because <laughs> what we have isn't important. It's just it's not enough. It's about discovering this, this transformation that happens through the process. That we're called to follow Jesus into it so that we might see a new reality open before us. And that's the gift of life that is found in Christ. That's what we're invited into. And so we can't get overly excited about just the one half of the story without seeing the whole story. That Jesus wants to redeem the whole of our humanity and invite us into a very different quality of life. Amen? Phew, I think that's enough. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that we belong to you. Sometimes following you is not so easy. Sometimes we get ourselves on roads that don't necessarily lead to to life, but we find ourselves at dead ends. And so we pray that you would lead us back to the reality of your love. That you would also lead us back to the reality that there's no greater life than to live our lives devoted to love, to bringing that love to the world, to sharing it and telling the story with all those around us who find themselves discouraged. And so, Lord, strengthen your church. Help us, Lord, to live in such a way that people would see the reality of your life flowing in us. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Thank you that as we look there, you reveal your, the wonder of your love for us and the wonder of your love and your redemptive project for this world. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. Let's stand together for our final song. Come set your rule and reign in our, in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfires in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. We need your power in us. And we seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. Refuse to waste our lives. For you're our joy and prize To see the captive hearts released The hurt, the sick, the poor 
church and we pray revive this earth build your kingdom here let the darkness fear show your love inspire change the atmosphere build your kingdom here we pray unleash your kingdom's power reaching the near and far no force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts you made us for much more than this awake the kingdom seed in us fill us with the strength and love of christ because we are your church we bear the hope on earth and yes it's okay if you want to clap here we go build your kingdom here let the darkness fear show your mighty hand heal our streets and land set your church on fire let your We could probably sing that one again, couldn't we? I like that. Some good music today. Thank you. Um, we close the, this morning, the service, with uh, words from St. Patrick's Breastplate. Uh, there's actually a long prayer that he offers. It's beautiful. Talking about Christ present with him. Uh, he was one who was bold with God's love and speaking to the people of Ireland. And may God also inspire the same kind of boldness in us as we go to live our lives for Christ in the world. And so, following the benediction, we'll join together uh, in this response. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship, the communion of the Holy Spirit, be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen. Christ be beside me, Christ be before me, Christ be behind Christ be below me, Christ be above.